divided by two times the cosinus of two theta and the P S which is not a shear component of the vector on this plane is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 divided by 2 times the sinus of 2 theta. And this is a very interesting way to express the normal and the shear stresses on this plane. Because maybe you remember that in the quantitative evaluation course last year, we made a plot of the sinus of an angle against the, the cosine of the angle. If you plot the sinus of an angle against the cosine of an angle, what you get is a circle. So this here is the equation of a circle. And this circle is called the Mohr circle. It was invented by a German engineer, Otto Mohr. <coughs> and the Mohr circle is known and taught to many, many students in the RBTH in all kinds of different engineering sciences. Even our video the cameraman knows about it. And to make this a little bit easier for you to grasp, I make a couple of very simple little simulations for you. Again, it is part of this spreadsheet. It is part of this little spreadsheet program that you can download and you can play with. And I hope it will work. Before I show you this uh, little demo, uh, are we going to clean the air filter? <laughs> so here, the drawing of the plane is the stress vector on it, decomposed into normal shear stress. And here is this stress tensor made out of this little matrix and the way that you calculate the stress on the plane. Okay. So here in this sheet I use S instead of P, but the derivation is really the same thing. And if you now take the normal stress and the shear stress on this particular plane and you plot them against each other, normal stress and shear stress, then you get a circle and this is the more circle. Now go to my demo. And what I've done here <coughs> is I made this little matrix 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, which is the same as 1, 2, and 2. And I put in here 0 0.5 and 2 as numbers, of course you can put in all kinds of numbers if you want. But now you cannot put in numbers here which are different from that. That is not allowed in the stress. Otherwise it's very simple. And here is the plane normal oriented at this point 90 degrees to the first axis. Okay, so here is my plane. This is my plane normal. And the vector is this green line here. It is normal to my plane and it is exactly too long. This was the very this was the second simple exercise that I showed you. And now if I put in here 45 degrees and enter, then I get my plane at 45 degrees, because it's normal like that. This is the plane, this is the plane normal, and here is my stress vector calculated. And what you can see is that if I turn around my plane then the tails of the stress vectors on the plane lie in an ellipse. This is called the stress ellipse. And of course, in the previous lecture you have seen that 
a very simple matrix transforms the circle into an ellipse, so it is not a surprise that this happens. And now I can put any number here if I want. For example, I put 0 0.8 here, and 1.1 or 1.2, and I get an ellipse which is almost a circle. Of course, this is 0 0.8, this is 0 0.2. Two, I can still go around and I get the stress. And what is very important to realize that in almost all of these orientations, the stress vector is not perpendicular to the plane. It is mostly a little bit misoriented. And this misorientation of the stress vector leads to earthquakes because it has a component that can shear. Now what I've done here is I calculated the normal component and the shear component of my stress vector. These two numbers are the coordinates of my stress vector on the plane. And then what I've done is I've plotted this normal component and shear component against each other. And I've opened this paper now. Here it is. The shear component is this much, the normal component is this much. This is my plane in the new diagram, it is a point. And if I turn around my plane, for example, I give it another orientation like 80, then I see that when my plane turns around, the tail of this stress vector remains on the ellipse, and here, my point is traveling around in the circle. I thought it's very interesting to note, and you can play around with it if you downloaded this spreadsheet, that this point on the circle travels twice as fast as this is rotating. And the reason for that is that we have this two theta in the formula of the derivation. Okay. So I will be very brief with now with this one now. Uh, in the main lecture, I will talk about it a little uh, longer, but you can download it, and I would really invite you to, to use this tool to understand the components of stress. Maybe one final example. What happens if I put one and one into these two S11, S22 cells? In that case, my stress and it becomes a circle, and because of that, my more circle becomes a point, because it has shrunk into very, very tiny, very, very tiny area. Okay? So this is the situation of the stress which you have in the underwater. If you go diving or swimming underwater, the stress on every direction is the same. This is what is called a hydrostatic stress or an isotropic stress. If the stress is anisotropic, like in a solid, then you have the stress ellipse in the muscle. Okay, so now let's take a few minutes break and then continue with the lecture.
we have learned that to get equilibrium, this one and that one have to be the same, otherwise my little cube starts to spin. And that if you now take the normal and the shear component of that stress tensor for all the different planes possible, and you plot them, then you get a circle. So this stress in a point, which is really the collection of stress vectors and all different possible planes, can be represented by this more circle diagram. And in the future lectures, I really expect you to understand this in some basic way, because I'm going to draw a lot of circles, a lot of more circles during this course. Okay. I started uh, one of the slides in this uh, lecture by saying that normal stress and shear stress are very important ways to plot these stress components because it is the basis of friction. So now let's talk a little bit about friction. Here is a picture that should surprise some of you. Uh, it is a picture which was taken with a camera without any Photoshop. And the way we did this is that we did it on a very steep slope. So Frank, who used to be one of our students, is actually standing there, he's leaning backwards, and the slope he's standing on is this thick. So the only thing I did is I rotated my camera. And the reason why this is possible is because there is a lot of very good quality friction on the wrist feet. So what is friction? One of the basic laws of physics, mechanics, is that if you have two little blocks, and there is no gravity in this particular case, but there is just this force, this angle, then the blocks will slide if there is a critical angle between this force vector, and it doesn't really matter how big the force is. The force can be big or small, it is the angle which determines whether you can slide it or not. And this F, or if you want to divide it by the area, then it becomes the P, the stress vector on the plane. It can be decomposed into a normal component and a shear component, we have seen that before. And now, to define whether the two blocks are going to slide or not slide, all you have to do is you have to make this diagram where this is the shear stress on the plane and this is the normal stress in an alternative notation from the piece that I used for the right derivation people also use the tau and sigma n notation. Then what you will get here is that there is this line with this critical angle, which is called the friction angle. And if the stress on the plane is below the line, everything is stable, nothing will happen. And if you are on the line, you will start sliding, and this part of the diagram is impossible. You cannot get there, because the moment you reach the line, you will start to slide. So this is the very, very simple law of friction. To get this a little bit better in your understanding, I made a very simple exercise. So here is the question. I have a base, like a street, and there is a big sandstone block. There is 1.5 meter high, and I want to move it over a horizontal surface. What I know is that the density of the sandstone is 2,200 kilograms per cubic meters. What I also know is the friction coefficient, which is the tangent of the friction angle, is 0.85. The acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meter per second squares. And what I want to know is the shear stress tau which you need to move this block. So imagine it is a huge block of sandstone, 1.5 meters high. It's enormous, it's very, very heavy. And I'm asking you the stress 